Okay, good evening, Rabbi We're going to talk tonight about uh, a very important mitzvah. Now, how do we get to the, talking about this mitzvah? Where is the source for this? What's the reason why we're talking about it? Because uh, what happened was that this week, our friend Rabbi Aaron, you know, downstairs, he uh, opened up a gemach. You know, so what's a gemach? In Hebrew, the word gemach is like an abbreviation, gemilut hasadim. You know? So what does that mean? That you're doing kindness for people, you know, some kind of acts of kindness. So what kindness are we talking about? He opened uh, a loan program, you know, that a person needs a loan, interest-free loan, a Jewish guy can come and get a loan. That was his whole thing, you know? So it's considered to be a very nice thing to do for the Jewish people, like Chesed, said, because you don't want to charge them interest and so forth, and so on, you know? The interest is very destructive, very deadly. It's a very big sin. <clears throat> so therefore, what happened was that he made an event over here uh, the other night, and uh, he asked me to come and speak there. You know, this was Saturday night, Moti Shabbat. So I went to speak there, you know, and uh, it just took like f- five or six minutes, you know, and I tried to explain, according to the Torah, the importance of uh, giving loans to your fellow Jew, you know. So now, what I want to do is I want to do like a long version of that, more comprehensive to understand the whole gamut of this uh, mitzvah. So the truth is, you know, that we find this in the book of Shemot, in Exodus, where we are now, right? It says over there, Im kesef talve, uh, la mitecha. What does that mean? That the Torah tells us, if you will lend money to your fellow Jew, right? So you may think, by the way, that this is like optional, because it says, if you lend. It doesn't say you must lend in the Torah. It says, Im kesef talve, if you lend. So come the Chazal, and right away they say, no, it's not talking about here that it's optional. Right? The proper way to understand it is that you must lend. So what does that mean? That when a person is approached by his fellow Jew, he tells him, listen, you know, like my friend, I'm in, I'm in bad shape, I need a loan. You know? So you must give him if you have. If you have what to give him. Mm-hmm. Give him a loan. <clears throat> this is what the Torah teaches us. So it comes in the Chazal and they say that it's an obligation to do so. And the Rambam also says this in the Halachot. He brings the Mishnah Torah, says the Rambam, you must give a loan to your fellow Jew. Right? What does that mean if he's poor? Because if he's rich, you know, I mean, he doesn't need your loan. You know I mean, that's something else. But at least when he's not rich, um, he's poor, so you must give him. You must give him a loan. So, okay, fine. So what does that mean? That if a person comes to you, you must lend him. But the question is, you know, where does this rank in terms of the mitzvot? So comes the Gemara and Masechet Shabbat. It says over there, Samech Gimel Amud Aleph, it says over there, 63a. In the numbers, the miracle system. So it says over there that lending a Jew, your fellow Jew money, is considered to be bigger than giving tzedakah. There's a hierarchy when it comes to mitzvot, you know? giving, Doing chesed, doing kindness for your fellow Jew. So lending him is greater than giving him tzedakah. question is why, right? Why? Because, you know, usually giving a freebie, you get a freebie, you don't have to pay it back. It sounds much better, no? Much more tempting. So why is it considered to be a bigger mitzvah to lend him than to give him tzedakah? So say the Rambam and the Rashi, they both agree. They say the reason is because when you lend him, you're not embarrassing him like that. What does that mean? When you give him tzedakah, it's like a handout, you know? Okay, like your pauper, you know? Like, okay, I'll give you, you know? All right, here's my wallet. You know, I'll open it up. Take, you know? And so it's like he's degraded by that. He's embarrassed. Because you're, you're making him into a... You're making him to a miskin, you know, a, a mm-hmm. pathetic case, you know, a, a sorry case. So, but when you give him a loan, he considers it like more, you know, it's normal. It's like, you know, even rich people take loans, you know. Trump takes loans, de- dealing with banks all the time, you know un- what I mean? What if he's unable to pay you back? <clears throat> We're going to talk about that. It's a very good question. So the point is, right, that uh, giving him a loan, it's like, you know, you're saving face. What does that mean? You're giving him more credence. Like, you know, you're, 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 you're a normal guy. You know, you're not, a, you're not a pathetic dude, you know? You're normal. I'm giving you a loan, just like everybody else takes a loan. Rich people take, also take loans for business, for all kinds of things. So you're, you're making him more like kavod. You're giving him more honor. You're giving him more, more credence. And this is the reason why it's better to give him a loan, you know? Just, by the way, on, on the side, I also want to mention, Gemara says over there another thing, which is there's also something even better than a loan as well. <sighs> So, in other words, we have tzedakah, we have loans, and there's one thing which is even above that. You know what that is? <clears throat> so, what it is, is the giving a person, uh, you know what it, uh, it's called in the Gemara? 
Dame kis. You know what that means? It means you're giving him money to invest. In other words, you're, you're telling him, listen, take some money, you know, do investment, uh, start a business, and I'll take like, you know, 50% of your profits. In other words, I'm giving you money to invest, you do, do business, and I'll also be a partner with you. This is even better than giving him a loan. What's the reason? Why? Because here you're really treating him like, a, you know, like an important person. You know? Oh, I'm a businessman, you know? Like, you know, I'm a big shot, I'm a big wheeler and dealer. I'm not, a, I'm not a pathetic dude. So that's considered to be the best thing. You're, you're respecting him even more. Mm -hmm. You're giving him a lot of credence over here, a lot of honor by doing that. So you're making him like a businessman. You're giving him credibility. So that's even better to give him, like, you know, investment money. You know? There's also another reason, by, by the way, that it's the best thing to do, to give him investment money. It's better than giving him a loan. It's better than giving him tzedakah. Because when you give him investment money, you're also giving him a way to get parnasa, you know, on a, on a permanent basis. You know what I mean? In other words, he'll be able to live on that. Do more business, more business, you know, another investment, another thing, the buying here, selling over there, stocks, bonds, all kinds of stuff, right? Hedge funds, all kinds of things. Bitcoins going into this, going to here, going out of there. And he's going to be able to, you know, one thing leads to another and you'll, you'll become a successful businessman. You'll be able to make a living for quite a while, maybe all his life. You never know, right? So what does that mean? Instead of like giving him a handout, you know, which is disrespectful in a way, you know, like, oh, yeah, I'll give you, you poor thing, you know. Yeah. This way what you're doing is you're building him into a businessman, you know, much more respectable. You know, he'll be smoking a cigar, you know, driving a new S-Class, you know, he'll be, you know, oh, you know, became a big tycoon, this guy, all of a sudden. You know, uh, that's what it is, right? So that's considered to be even better. Okay, we're not going to talk about that today so much, but I did want to mention that. You know, there's also different levels. The Rambam also talks about another thing, which is there's also levels regarding the types of tzedakah you give, the way you give tzedakah, you know? There's all different levels there. What does that mean? There's a level where he gets embarrassed more, so it's considered to be a lower level of tzedakah. What does that mean? He knows that you gave him, you know? But if you gave him in a roundabout way, he doesn't know it was you. That's better. Why? Because you're not embarrassing him. You know what I mean? So there's also that uh, particular also to, to, to keep in mind. When you give tzedakah, the best way to give it is a way which honors him more and doesn't embarrass him and doesn't associate him with picking that. Right? Meaning what? It's done in a way, indirect way. That it shouldn't know about it. Anonymously. You know? Anonymous giving. Okay, very good. Also, all kinds of things like that. I'm not going to talk about that tonight so much. But anyway, getting back to the issue of loans, right? So, to understand this, uh, by the way, uh, there's an illustration that I saw uh, from the Khatam Sofer. You know, Khatam Sofer was about 250 years ago. One of the big Chachamim in Europe, in Hungary, he was a big Chacham over there. One of the great Chachamim of that generation. <coughs> so what happened was that uh, a certain person comes to Khatam Sofer, and he asks him a question. He says... Uh, Rabbi, you know, like I'm, you know, my, I'm, I, I'm like totally going overboard here. I'm like down and out. My businesses are failing. I mean, I'm having a hard time, you know. And he says, I wonder, like, you know, if you can maybe give me a blessing or, you know, some kind of thing, you know, bless me, you know, do something to pray for me that I should be able to c get out of my rut. I'm financially very down. So Hatam Sofer listens to this, you know. He tells him, he says. I'm sorry, but it says, I really can't help you, you know, uh, I can't really do nothing for you. But it says, uh, but you can help yourself, tells him. You want to help yourself? So it tells him, okay, how do I do that? So it tells him, I know, he says, I know that there's a family member of yours, a relative, you know, who's down and out. And he says, I know that this guy is in bad shape and nobody's helping him, you know, like in, from the whole family there. So he says, why don't you, you know, take it upon yourself to help him? You know, like either yourself or organize something to help him. You know what I mean? Do something to, to help him out. So, uh, tell tells this guy, he says, but Rabbi says, I'm sorry, you know, so I understand what you're saying. Believe me, I, I know what you're talking about. But the problem is that I myself are not doing, not doing well, you know? So I'm also down. My businesses are down. You know, I don't really have my right, right now money to, to lend anybody any money. I don't have the money to do that. I'm also down. So, so I wish I could do it, but I can't. So uh, tells him the Khatam Sofer. So he says, let me tell you something interesting. So he quotes him a pasuk, you know, a verse, which comes from, uh, this comes from the Chumash also, the Parsha Shavuot that we're reading this week. Mm -hmm. 
which is Va'era. It's over there in uh, Shemot, in Perak Vav, 6 six Perak. It says over there, right at the beginning of the parsha. it says that, uh, um, God, the God, it says Hashem to Moshe Rabbeinu, when he's telling him, you know, to go bring the Jews out of Egypt. You know, that whole episode where he's like telling him to bring the Jews out, to let my people go, tell, go to Paro and tell them, let my people go. So Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, is discussing all kinds of things with him. So HaKadosh Baruch tells him like this, Gam ani shamati nakat b'nei Yisrael. I also you know? heard. Right. Yeah. Nakat, you know what that means? Like, mm-hmm. They're crying out, you know, like the cries. They're, mm-hmm. you know, they're crying out to me. I heard it. I also heard. So, you know, the question is like this, right? Uh, why does it say, also I heard? Like, you know, just say, Gani shamati. Just say, I heard. What does it mean, Gamani? Like uh, somebody else be, besides me, you know? There's a different guy there, you know, who's also uh, involved. How many gods are there, you know? There's only one god, no? So, for Gamani, what does that mean? I also heard. So, therefore, comes, uh, comes Hatab Sofer, and he says, you know what, what the idea is over here? That the Chazal say that when it says Vegamani, that means that I also heard because the Jews already had a system in place to do chesed for each other, to do acts of kindness, you know. And once they start to do that, lending each other money, helping each other, all kinds of things, good deeds, kind deeds. So then Hashem said, you know what? Vegamani shamati, you know. Now I heard also. What does that mean? That since they helped each other, I'm going to step in also and help them as well. So Tatam Sofer told him, he says, if you want Hashem to help you, to step in and help you, you first organize for others. That's what you learn from there, you know. When the Jews help each other, then Hashem helps, in, helps them too. The Gamani, I also. That's what God says. What do you mean I also? Because already the Jews started to do it. And I'm continuing. That's what, that's what it means, you know. So therefore he tried to inspire him to tell him, you know, listen, you know, if you really want to succeed in your life, this is the way you got to do it. Start, start first of all yourself. There's also another thing they say in the, in the name of a son, Ketab Sofer. You know, the Ketab Sofer was also a big gaon, uh, like his father, Khatam Sofer. Right? Uh, why, by the way, these names, Ketab Sofer, Khatam Sofer, these were not their real names. These are the names of their books, you know, but we call them after that name of the book. You know, like that's the way it is. And the rabbis are usually called by the book that they wrote. Yeah, that's very, very, very common, you know? So we have Khatam Sofer, we have Ketab Sofer. So Ketab Sofer was his son. He also said another thing, which is interesting. What, what does that mean? That there's also another Gemara in Masechet Yevamot, in uh, Samech Gimel Amud Alf. Same page, but different, different tractate. This was Shabbat. Now we're going into Yevamot, right? Which is talking about leveret marriage. Okay, so, anyway, it says over there in Yevamot, Hamalve et chavero kesef What does that mean? A person who lends his fellow Jew money. In a time of his need, in a time where he's really down and out, you know, what happens is it brings a pasuk from the Tehilim. It says that Kadosh Baruch is going to save you from all your problems, from all your, from all your issues that you have. You'll be safe from everything. That's because you lend him money when he's when he was down, right? So, uh, okay, that's a very interesting thing. But like, what's the big deal? Like, you know, okay, lend him money. He's down. Okay, so lend him money. So he's going to be safe from everything. What's the big deal over here? Why is he going to be safe from all his problems? Because he lent them money. That's such a great thing to do like that, to lend money. So, therefore, right, it says the Ketav Sofer. This is also brought down, by the way, in, in a different rabbi. Imre Emet, one of the Admorim of Guru. The Admor of Guru. He also writes this. Same thing, same idea. That when the Gemara says that when you lend money to your fellow Jew, Beshat Hako, when he's down and out, it doesn't mean that the, the borrower is down and out. It means the lender is down and out. You know what I mean? So now it begins, it begins to make more sense. What does that mean? Because you lend him money at a time where you can't, you yourself are not doing well. That's a big sacrifice, right? Self-sacrifice, right? Because you you really shouldn't be doing that. You know, like, naturally speaking, what should you say? You should say, listen, I can't do it because, you know, like, I'm also down myself. This is exactly what this guy was saying to the rabbi. I'm also down. I can't lend him money. You know? So no, the whole thing is like this, right? That when you lend money, when you're down, right, that's a big self sacrifice because you're taking a gamble. You know, you yourself are not so stable right now. You also make you may like fall down like a domino. You know, tilt over. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down, right? It's a kind of thing like this. So, so therefore, since you went out of your way 
in a miraculous manner. Uh, this is not the nature of the world. A person doesn't usually lend money, lend money when he's himself down. So therefore, when you did that, you went out of your way. So just like you did in a, in a miraculous manner, in a, a, a natural manner, you did something above and beyond what's expected of you. So Hashem says, just like you did, I'm going to also do to you the same thing. I'm going to go above and beyond with you. Save you from all your problems, you know. Erase everything from you. Get you out of all your, all your, all your problems. So you see from there, right, that it's an amazing thing that Kadosh Baruch Hu tells you like this. You know, I'm going to save you from everything. Why is that? Because you yourself are down. I'll tell you something interesting, by the way, a similar story that I, uh, I personally heard from my friend. There was a certain rabbi that I knew in, in Israel. He was in my yeshiva. We were together over there. In the Kolel Maran, Yechavadat. So over there, uh, what happened was that he told me an interesting story. He says, I'll tell you, you know, uh, an interesting story. He says, when I got married, I was young, Avrech, you know, studying in yeshiva. And he says, they were paying me in the kolel that, that I was in. Kolel is like a yeshiva for, for married uh, married men. So he tells them, you know, I was getting, they were giving me $400 salary every month. Can you imagine? $400. What do you do with $400? You know, you can base, you can't, you can't even go to the supermarket uh, with, for a month for $400. So he says, but I'll tell you something. He says, my rent was 600 You know, <laughs> My rent was 600 but my salary was 400 How do you live like that? <laughs> what kind of life is that, right? So therefore, you know, he felt like, man, you know, that's what's going to be? How can I live like this? So he goes to one rabbi, you know? You know who this rabbi was? This rabbi was Rabbi Scheinberg. Uh, who was Rabbi Scheinberg? Rabbi Scheinberg actually was from Queens. From this area, he was the mashgiach of Chafetz Chaim. You know, yeshiva that you were in, but the bigger, the bigger size. You know, the, the older guys, right? The, the other building. You know, they had two buildings. You remember the other thing? Whatever. But anyway, right, the one of the buildings was in Forest Hills over there, like on the other side, on Juno, whatever it is, right over there, all the way up there. Now they moved to Main Street, by the way. They're not there anymore. They're in Flushing now. But anyway, what happened was that uh, Rabbi Scheinberg used to be there. He was a mashgiach. But then he left uh, America and he went to Israel. He opened his own yeshiva over there in Israel, in Jerusalem. So anyway, he went to Rabbi Scheinberg. He was a big chacham, you know. So he told him, he said, Rabbi, you know, my rent is 600, my salary is 400. What do I do? How do I make it like that? <laughs> you know? So what does he tell him, Rabbi? He blew him away, you know, like he told him something. He got blown away by this. So the rabbi tells him, you know what you have to do? He says, you got to give more tzedakah. That's the only way to do it. <laughs> so he's like, looking around, you know, you know, like, what? More tzedakah? I don't have money to pay my rent. <laughs> How can I give more tzedakah? What, what am I supposed to do, you know? So he says, nevertheless, I listened to what he said. he said. You know? So what does that mean? What did he do? He took upon himself at that time, you know, like, uh, like a neder, you know, like a vow, you know, whatever. He's going to give 10% of all salary always to, to, to Dakar. Mm. So what did he do? He says, you know, he says, tells me, let's make, I'll make you laugh, right? He says, I'm, he, says I'm, you know, he was Persian, this guy, right? This rabbi. So he tells him, he says, I'm Persian. He says, I'm very cheap, you know? You know Persians, you know, how, how we are. We're, you know, very frugal people. So he tells me, so therefore, you know, I decided to give 10% of my, of my salary to Dakar. But he says, I wanted to make sure that it goes to the right place. You know? No monkey business, you know what I mean? No, no scams. So what does he do? He goes uh, right and looks for uh, Avrech, you know, somebody who's learning in yeshiva, married guy, and you know he's poor and needs like you know he needs like a supplemental salary to get by to finish the month. So he finds somebody like this, you know. So he tells him he says because I'm Persian, you know, I'm cheap, you know. He tells me, you know, uh, he says I went to his house just to check, you know, like to make sure that he's really poor. You know, like the furniture is not so good. <laughs> Things like this, right? To make sure that it's really, it's a real thing. He's not living in the lap of luxury over there, you know? Some luxury apartment. You know what I mean? Making a scam. So he says, I checked and he says, he was really poor, this guy, you know? So says, I decided to give him 10% of my money every month. So he says, since then I must tell you. So he tells me, he says, it's a true story, you know? This is not secondhand information, first hand. So he tells me, he says, since then, he says, I've been doing very well. Always going up, you know, my financial portfolio, going up. You know, never had problems financially. So he attributes that to one thing. Because what? Because he did this self-sacrifice, you know what I mean? When he himself was down, 
to give tzedakah, even though he couldn't afford it. In other words, according to nature, you shouldn't give one penny in a situation like that. You can't even pay your rent. But nevertheless, he got himself out of it, you know, this rut, by giving more tzedakah. Taking on to give 10% every month. Which is incredible for a person like that, in that situation. You know what I mean? So that's what happened with this guy. So you see, the met that whatever the Gemara says over there is very, very true. And as we said, right, the giving alone is considered to be better than giving tzedakah. So it's even on a higher level. So when you give your, your fellow Jew alone, in the time that you're down, Hashem saves you from everything. Because it's above nature what you're doing. You know what I mean? That's what it is. It's an amazing concept, this whole thing. Whatever. Okay, interesting, right? So anyway, let's get back to a little bit uh, what we're talking about. So uh, the, now, as, I, as we said, right, that both these Gemarot are on the same page, on a different tractate. Samech Gimel. So the, if you look at the words Samech Gimel in Hebrew, what does that word mean, those two letters? It's a root of a word, you know? So why would they put it on the same page on different different Gemara? So the truth is, you know, we can say, make a little kiddush, make a novel idea. The idea is like this, right? That the word Samech Gimel in, in Gemara, you know what it means? To like, to be achieved, you know, to, to attain, to grow, to get higher, you know, to increase. So the word sagi, you know, in Aramaic and Hebrew, that's what it means. So what does that mean? The Gemara is trying to tell you, right, that if you give loans to your fellow Jew, you're going to be increasing, you're going to be successful. Your portfolio is going to go up. That's exactly why it's giving you this um, this page, right, the, the Gemara on this page. So we see from there how big it is to um, to give tzedakah and uh, even bigger to give a loan to your fellow Jew, right? Very good. So, um, by the way, also I want to stress, right, that this lesson that we learned regarding this case of this rabbi, the, the lesson to learn from there is like this, you know, which is, by the way, considered to be a very strong lesson for every Jew. That if you're financially not doing so well, you know, your mazal is not so good. So the way to get yourself out is to, like, you know, increase zaka. Even though right now you're not in shape to do that, but the fact that you do it, like you're overcoming that rut that you're in, you know, that that uh, financial rut that you're right in right now, and the mazal is down. You know, your fortune is down. The way to do it is to overcome it over that hurdle is to get over it with tzedakah, more tzedakah. So this is the solution to a person who feels like that he's financially, you know, just not doing, not surviving. He's not making ends meet. You know, he's not above water. You know, underwater. Okay. That's the way to do it. Okay, very good. So we see from there, by the way, uh, obviously, that uh, it's a great mitzvah. Now to go on to the other side of the story, right? Which is what? That sometimes a person can give a loan and also do a very big sin as well. You know? Unfortunately, you know, we had this problem in this area many years ago, you know, when, when I was here. A lot of people were doing this racket, you know, this whole racket, racket thing. What were they doing? They were lending money on interest. You know what I mean? So what does it what does it say about that in the Torah, right? Uh, that when you lend money, as that pasuk that we mentioned over there, it says, right? When you lend money to a fellow Jew, right? Don't take from him an interest. Don't take from him interest. Don't take interest from him. So the Torah explicitly tells us you're not allowed to take interest. And the word neshech, which is called which is called interest in Hebrew, what does that mean? Noshech. You ever hear a word like that? What does it mean in Hebrew? Unashachoti. He bit me, right? So it's biting, you know? So the word interest in Hebrew means to bite. You understand why? You get the point? In other words, every time, every month, you're biting him by taking more than you lend him. So you're like destroying the guy, you know? You piece by piece, you're taking him apart. You know? So you're biting the guy. You know what I mean? So therefore, the Torah tells us, don't do this to your fellow Jew. Give him an interest loan. Because you're destroying the guy like this, you know. Every month he has to think, how am I going to pay back the money and also more? You know, I can't do it. It's going to sink like this. So like, you know, you're destroying him because that's going to make him go down even more and more and more and more until, until he can't take it anymore. He's going to have to, like, you know, renege altogether on the, whole, on the whole program. So therefore it's considered to be a very big sin. I saw in the Midrash, by the way, it says over there, several things it says about a person who gives on a beat. First of all, Chazal said, that a person who lends money on a beat on interest 
אין לו חלק לעולם הבא, יש לו לא פורשן לעולם הבא. אתה יודע, זה כנסו לי איזה ביג סן, זה כאילו טוטלי אימורל. אנחנו מדברים על כשאתה לומד לך פלאו ג'ו, בגלל זה, לא לתת גוי. לתת גוי אתה לא יכול לעשות אינטרס, אתה יכול לתת להם אינטרס, אבל אתה יכול לתת להם אינטרס מהם, אז לא. אין לך פרוביישן. כשאתה לומד לך פלאו ג'ו, אתה לא יכול לתת להם אינטרס, או לתת להם אינטרס, זה אותו דבר. Borrowing is just big sin as it's then lending. Both of them are sinners. So it says in Midrash, by the way, that a person who does this, HaKadosh Baruch Hu pays him back right away. You know, in other words, he punishes him very quickly. You know, like there's no, before no time, in, in no time, you know. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives him a big wallop, he wallops him, you know. And what happens is that because he lent money on interest, eventually what's going to be is he's going to go down, you know. He's going to get financially very, very in bad shape. Just like he did to others, you know, he bit them. He bit away at everything they had. They're going to bite away also, bite him as well. Bite away at him until he has nothing left. So Kadosh Baruch Hu doesn't, doesn't, doesn't wait to punish a person like that. He takes who lends money on interest. Wow. And also the borrower, by the way, as well, as well, is a sinner. No question about it, both of them. The borrower is also a sinner. Why did you agree to do that? There's also another um, a way that a person can give a loan and be also a sinner. You know, looking at the other side, right? You know what it is? That a person who lends money, it says in Shulchan Aruch, it says over there, that if you lend money to your fellow Jew, and you don't have witnesses there, he transgresses. Uh, it's a big sin. What's a big sin? Right? You know what that means? You know what that means? Don't put a stumbling block before your fellow Jew. What does that mean? You're causing him to sin. So what's the sin over here? What's going on? Right? What's, the, what's the situation? So what happens is like this, right? It says, it says the Shulchan Aruch, when you lend a person money and you don't have witnesses there, how many witnesses do you need, by the way? You need two, according to the Torah. One is not enough for, for monetary cases. You need two witnesses. Two kosher witnesses, right? So what does that mean, kosher? They keep Shabbat. They keep the mitzvot. They don't shave with a razor, you know. <laughs> so, now, comes the... Uh, like comes Shulchan tells you that what's going to happen like this, right? He may forget that you lend him money. It happens. People forget. So what happens is that now you're going to come to him, you know, a month later. Okay, where's my money, dude? Didn't I lend you $5,000? I don't remember such a thing like that tells you. What $5,000? What are you talking about? Ah, oh, but you no good, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right? Starts to curse him, whatever. Why does this happen, this whole thing? Because he doesn't remember, and now this guy's angry at him, and he has no way to prove it, because there's no witnesses. Nobody was there mm-hmm. to watch the thing, you know? So it's your word against my word, you know? Let's go, to, okay, sue me in court, you know? You say I owe you, I say I don't owe you. Who's going to win? Nobody. Can't do any, anything with that. Right? The money stays where it is. So that what, that's what happens is that you're causing your fellow Jew to sin by not having witnesses because he may deny the loan because he doesn't remember. He forgot it. And now you're going to cause him to sin because he's going to renege on the loan. So by the way, when a person reneges on a loan, what is that? What sin is that? When you renege on a loan, there's a sin like that. You know what that means? He's a gazlan. He's a thief. He's not repaying you your money that, you, that he owes you. Kurdia, you know, banditia, you know. That's what it is, right? By the way, this is like, practically speaking, it just happens all the time. You may think it's like far-fetched, you know, but people forget. I'll tell you a true story, right, over here that happened in the shul. Who told me this? The president, you know, so-so bidzia, you know, so-so. What does he tell me? He comes to me one time, you know, he likes to, sometimes he likes to, like, you know, yap with me a little bit, you know, whatever, you know, discuss yeah, some yeah. things, you know, whatever. I don't know why, but, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> whatever, but he tells me like this, a true story, he tells me. So he says, what happened was that one time I borrowed money from somebody, you know, in the community, whatever. And it was like, you know, big, large, large sum of money. And it wasn't a small, small change, pocket change, you know. So he says, okay. So he says, I paid him back. So comes the guy right now, right? Uh, like, you know, some time later. And tells him, uh, where's my money? So he tells him, what money? I already paid you. I paid you already. So he says, no, you didn't. You never paid me. Yeah? You're lying. 
So he tells them, I promise you, I prayed you, what can we do? You know, they had no witnesses. Nobody was there. So he got on his case, you know. Oh, you know, what did you, what did you do to me? You took my money. Now I have no money. Blah, blah, blah. Now you, you know, you put me in the, into, the, into the pit now. You know, got me into the gutter. I have no witnesses. I have no proof. I can't do nothing. So they got into like a whole big fight, you know, big ruckus, you know, and doesn't know what to do. He paid him, you know. He, he, he remembers that he paid him. Go figure who's right, who's wrong, you know, whatever. God knows. So what happens is like this, right? That uh, eventually he, he remembered one thing, so so, you know, he remembered that um, when he paid him back the money, it was in a place where there was a camera there, you know, there was surveillance. So then he thought of it, you know. He said, like, you know, let's go to the, uh, let's go to the people, you know, who manage that place, and the camera will show, that, you know, I, I was there. I, I paid you the money. I was there. I remember I paid you in that place. Can you imagine? You know. So what did they do? They went to the management, to that place, and he was right. You know, they had it on camera. He paid him. Can you imagine? Amazing, true story. You know. Insane. You know. So. This is what it comes to, you understand? When it, when you when you don't when you don't have witnesses, you're putting yourself in a very difficult situation. Yeah, but you know what I mean? You have to have some sense of decency. I mean, basically, you're you're denying. People forget, David. They just forget. They have a forgetful mind. You know, people. People are very distracted with all kinds of things in their head. You can. Forget. They have twenty things going on. You know, their family, their children, their you wife. Listen, this is the business. Blah blah blah. All I kinds of things. You know, excuse me. You, know? you can forget. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. insignificant things. Yeah. But you can't forget this because this is when you borrow money and somebody lends you money, he may be saving your life. It's a significant thing. How do you forget something like that? It's it's, it's possible. Uh, you know? maybe. It's, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. You know, you may you may. By the way, you're you're just the opposite of that, right? You remember everything. Yeah. You remember things from thirty years ago. It's all right as long as I made you say the word come up later. <laughs> okay, so now uh, yeah. let's understand that right a little bit more. So you see from there, the Shulchan Aruch says something even further than that, besides what we just mentioned, right? Um, what it says is like this, even if the, if the borrower is a Tamil Chacham, you know, Rabbi, you know, you know, Mr. Honest, Mr. Integrity, blah, 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 you know, still you have to have witnesses, it says Shulchan Aruch. Yeah. Don't rely on the fact that he's a Rabbi. No, witness is always good. It's an obligation, not good. Yeah. That's what we're trying to say, yeah. right? But you have to ask yourself, even if you don't remember such a detail, why would this guy approach me and accuse me of something like this? You know? <laughs> so if I don't remember it, then he's lying? Yeah. He's trying to extort money from me? Sometimes it's innocent. You know, yeah. people don't remember. Yeah. You know? yeah. So now let's, let, let's get to the rabbi, okay? So the rabbi can also be a problem. Oh, but the rabbi's honest. The rabbis don't lie, you know? They don't lie about that. They won't... They won't uh, ex- Take money from you, defraud you. So you know what it is? It says the Shulchan Aruch that the rabbi can also forget about loans. And even more so. Why is that? Because he's always studying Torah, you know? He's involved in the study, you know? So what are we talking about? You know, he forgets everything. He doesn't remember what's around him, you know? Like, you know? Shesulia, you know? Shesulia. Like he's inside, you know? I remember the story you told me about Abadi. You know, the, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, like uh, a, a visitor came. Uh, Netanyahu. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy, like, just, he was totally oblivious to it. Exactly, that's the whole thing, you know? So what, what I mean to say is that the rabbi is even more suspect to forget than a regular guy, okay. in a sense, you know what I mean? Because his mind is somewhere else. He's not in this world, you know? Like, yeah. he's somewhere else. He's, he's flying around somewhere. He's in the Torah. So this is the whole uh, this whole thing, you know. So you cannot rely on the fact that he's a chacham. You still have to have witnesses, no matter what. I wish I had a witness when you went off on Gil. I also wish. In, in the car, and you basically I also wish. Threatened to kill him. Okay, know? very good. Okay, very good. Okay, okay yeah, yeah, give, the, give us the footage of that. Let's go to the video. Okay, so right, comes the Shulchan Aruch tells you like this that the rabbi needs two. Don't rely on the fact that the guy's honest or he's not honest. You know, as you said, right, with my rabbi, Marana Ovadia, he was the epitome of this problem, you know, that he forgot things when he was learning. 
He wouldn't even remember what's going on. You want me to give you an example? You told me that story, right? I'll tell you, I'll tell you that story too, but there's also other like in more, more basic cases. The, you know, the story goes like this, right? Maran, Alvadia, they used to, they used to, you know, the whole family there that was living with him, everybody used to go to work. You know, he was the only one who stayed home and studied. Everybody else was going, going to his job. You know what I mean? So they left, them, they left them alone. He was alone in the house. So what they would do is they would leave him like a plate of food. You know, like a lunch, whatever, you know, brunch, whatever they want to call it. And they would say, okay, have this, and when we come home, we'll have dinner. Nice lunch for you, you know? Beautiful. Okay, so, you know, chicken, potato, salad, you know, all kinds of stuff, right? You know, the usual. So, uh, they would come home, you know, like 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night, you know? And see, the food is still there. Nobody touched it. <laughs> so they would go to the rabbi, you know, ask the rabbi. Say, rabbi, what happened? You didn't eat the food? <laughs> so you told I forgot, you know, Damovitz, though, you know, like, I forgot, you know? I forgot. I was studying, you know, I was studying. I forgot to eat. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is the way he was, the rabbi. He forgot everything. Another story I'll tell you. There was, uh, you know, by the way, these stories are also very important to understand because they show you how a real Chacham is devoted to his Torah. How they're devoted they are, you know, to the Torah. That they forget everything in this world. Another story is like this, right? The rabbi used to stay up like also like all night sometimes, you know? Until the morning or at least like 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning and study Torah. So he had a whole big library of books. <coughs> Huge library, you know, like the biggest in the world. So um, he would take out books, you know, and look in this one, look in that one. He would just pile them up, you know, like on one side like this, one pile here, one pile here. You know, like all the way till, till the roof, you know, till the ceiling, you know, like this. Like in Twin Towers. <laughs> so what happened was that he couldn't put away all these books. You know, he was an old man, you know, 90 years old already. He doesn't have the strength to put away books. I mean, it's bad enough they used to take them out. Now to put them away also. <coughs> so what happened was that uh, there used to come like a young, you know, Avrech, like a yeshiva guy, you know, in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, and he would clean up the books. He would put them back. This was his job. Very simple. You know, you come 6 o'clock in the morning, you put the books back, you go and pray, you do go about your day. So what happened was like this, right? That uh, this yeshiva boy would come in the morning, 6 o'clock, every day. So he would see the rabbi sometimes, you know, often. Still in his chair, you know, like still learning Torah. Six o'clock in the morning, you know. So he would tell the rabbi, he said, Rabbi, what happened? You didn't, you didn't sleep tonight? So he would tell him, Ah, oh, I forgot, well, I forgot to sleep. <laughs> That's what you tell him, you know. He forgets to sleep, forgets to eat, forgets everything when you're in Torah, you know what I mean? That's the way he was. The rabbi was totally engulfed in the Torah. Nothing, nothing would, would take him out. You know? Um, there's many other stories I can tell you about this. Really, really fascinating. But uh, what I want to tell you is that um, you see from there that the rabbis are very uh, want to forget. As you said, right, the story with Bibi. Right, what happened was with Bibi, he came over there, this was like eight years ago, they were thinking about bombing the nuclear reactor in Iran, you know? I think they're doing, thinking about doing it now also. But anyway, at that time, they were thinking to do it. So they wanted to consult with the rabbi, you know? What, is, what, is, what does he think about that? You know? Always they want to consult with the big hachamim. So they came over there, Bibi comes, you know? And he, comes, he comes there to visit the rabbi. And uh, the story was, he was supposed to come like late night, you know? Because at that time, there's nobody in the street. So it's, the security is much easier to, to, to provide at late night, you know? Because the Rosh Manshala, you know, the prime minister has a big security in Israel, you know, like big time, since Rabin was assassinated, you know, until, uh, since then, the security is like overwhelming, so what happens is that he comes over there with his big entourage, you know, whatever, you know? so he, uh, this is like two o'clock in the morning, so he comes over there, and the Elishai brings him in, he was the, at the time, the leader of Shas, you know, so he brings him in over there to the room, the rabbi's studying on the second floor, goes up there, Bibi, you know, and uh, he goes into the room, you know, and the rabbi's just sitting there looking in his book, Still studying, you know, whatever, you know. So he didn't even notice that BB came in, you know. He didn't have no idea that he came into the room. So what happens is that um, he, uh, 
he just like, stands there, you know, waiting. You know, so Elishai tells him, tells him, uh, should I should I tell the rabbi you're here? Should I interrupt him? So Bibi tells him, he says, no, no, let him continue. It says, <laughs> let him just go. <laughs> he didn't want to bother him, you know. So the tabda you know, you know. So because of that, he waited like 15 minutes, you know. And afterwards, after 15 minutes, he finally looked up, you know, and says, oh, oh you're here. Come in. <laughs> The same thing happened with Obama. They're blaming Obama that he disrespected yeah. Netanyahu. Maybe Obama forgot too. <laughs> remember when Obama? I think kept, he, just the opposite. He remembered very well. <laughs> remember when Obama kept Netanyahu waiting for hours or what? It, All kinds of tricks he put on him. He forgot, or yeah. he uh, purposely? Uh, they repaid him in China, by the way. Everything that they did over there, they got him over there. Okay, let's do it. for tap. What comes around goes around. Mida can get mida. Okay, so anyway, the point is like this, right? That the rabbis also can also forget. So therefore, a person has to know that. You know, that uh, no matter what, a person should try to have uh, always two witnesses for the loan. Otherwise, don't do it. Because you could get into a sin like that. There is also, by the way, an exception to this rule. We just said. What does that mean? That there could be, theoretically, a way to lend a person money without needing witnesses. What would that be? Right? Basically, it's very simple. If you're willing, in your mind, right, to give that money up and say, you know what, if this guy doesn't pay me, I forgive him. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in a case like that, you could do it without witnesses because you're willing to give part with that money, you know? Yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, psychologically, you let go already of that money. You know what I mean? So if that's the case, you psychologically are willing to, to you know, relinquish that, that right to, to collect the money. By the way, some people do this. You know what they do? As we said, right, that since giving a loan is considered to be better than giving tzedakah because you're not shaming the person like that. So what they do is they give somebody a loan, you know, but then they say, you know what, if he doesn't pay me, like, I just, I'll just leave him alone. You know, I won't even ask him for the money. So he intended to be like more tzedakah, you know, than a loan, but he's doing it in the guise of a loan that he shouldn't be embarrassed. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So in a case like that, if a person mm-hmm. is willing to, 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 to give up on the money, no problem, right? That's the idea, you know what I mean? So then he doesn't need witnesses. There's also another case, by the way, where this would apply. You know what it is? That he doesn't need witnesses? Let's say he lends money, right, with a mashkon. You know what that is, mashkon? Mashkon means that like, he gives a collateral. Mm-hmm. So if he has collateral, he leaves a guy collateral. What does that mean? You know, this classic case, right? That if I don't pay you, I'll leave you my gold watch, you know? So you take that as a payment. So if you have collateral, you don't really need witnesses anymore because the guy has where to collect from. You know, just in case you don't pay, he's got the collateral in his hands. You know what I mean? So in a case like that, where there's collateral, or in a case where uh, there, you know, you're willing to give up part with the money, in, things like, in cases like that, you don't need really witnesses. Because the whole point of the witnesses is to guard from what? From forgetting, you know, uh, a loan, like, you know, this kind of thing. I want to tell you another interesting thing. We'll end with this. There's also another thing in the Shulchan Aruch that says regarding giving loans. Something amazing. You know? By the way, you know, you see from there the wisdom of the Torah. You know? You may think it's very simple, but sometimes the simple things are the most amazing things. You know? Simplicity is very good. So, you know what it says in the Torah? In the Shulchan Aruch? It says that you shouldn't lend money, you know, as a, as a matter of principle to a person who's like, you know, like very irresponsible, you know, like, you know, the guy's just, he doesn't pay back money, he doesn't, you know, he's just a, he's a, he's a, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not careful about his deeds, he doesn't examine what he's doing, you know, lack of conscience, lack of moral conscience, doesn't matter, you know, he has a reputation like that, you know, this guy tells you, you know, he didn't pay me, you know, he embezzled me, stole from me, you know, he, he, he cheated me in business, you know, a person like this who has a bad reputation like this. Comes the Shulchan Aruch says, "Don't lend money to people like that, because you're you're asking for trouble. You know what I mean? Chances are he won't pay you. You know, chances are very high, 50-50, I don't know, or seventy-five, twenty-five, whatever it is. Ir- irresponsible people don't pay back their loans. That's what it is. You know. So therefore, says Shulchan Aruch, if you know somebody like that, don't lend him money, because you're gonna just wanna wind up, you know, between a rock and a hard place. He's gonna mess you up. This is the whole thing, you know." So, therefore, says Shulchan people like this, avoid them, you know, altogether. Don't deal with people like that. What do you need them for? 
You know, all they're going to do is, you know, give you, give you a big headache. You know, so, uh, therefore, right, there are certain cases, as we said, that a person should avoid giving a loan. So we see, right, there's three cases. We have the case of interest, we know, very bad sin. Or also doing without witnesses. Or also giving to somebody who's irresponsible. You know, somebody who's very, 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 uh, you know, how do you call that, right? He's like very, um, there's a name for that, whatever, I don't remember, I don't recall right now, but He's negligent, right? Negligent person, you know? He doesn't have any conscience. He doesn't mind lying, he doesn't mind you know, cheating, he doesn't mind any of these things, you know? No, no responsibility. A person like that, what can, what can you do with a person like that? You know, you gotta, you gotta avoid people like that. So therefore, you know, it can be, lending money can be a very big mitzvah on one hand, on the one hand it also can be a very big sin, depending on how you do it. You know, that's the idea, right? But, Whatever it may be, you know, but definitely we see from there that uh, what Rabbi Aaron wants to do, you know, to make a gamach, to lend money, it's a very big mitzvah, ben ben. I hope it works out, you know, meaning what? That it won't become some kind of a, you know, something that it shouldn't be, like we said, right? You know, they should lend money with witnesses because not everybody just can go and take the money and not come back. There won't be any money left to lend to somebody else. You know, how, how far can you sustain that? A person doesn't, you know, pay... You know, so how far can you go with that, right? Doesn't can't go forever like that. In six months, you'll be out of business already. Your gemach will become become a you know a, a memory, right? A fading memory. That's what it becomes, right? So, so therefore, even though now, what's the thing over here, right? That even though it's hard sometimes to bring witnesses because you know, like just you're lazy, you know. And, oh, leave me alone. I'll just give you the money, you know, like you know. But no, you're causing a sin like that to do it this way, you know. So you have to be careful about that. Don't just say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm busy now. I don't have time to bring witnesses. Bring it to people. What's the big deal? Otherwise, it's going to be your word against his. Can't prove nothing. And, you know, the, the eventualities, then, you, you know, you brought it on yourself. Hashem should help us. And we should have always uh, good things in Amisrael. You know, help each other and do the right thing with each other and help uh, one another. And then, as the, as, the, as the Pasuk said, right, if we help each other, Hashem will say, Gamani Shamati. Then I also, I'll help you too. Gamani Shamati. I also heard. I also get involved. Once you help each other, I also help you. Thanks for coming. God Amen. bless. Thank you. All the blessings. Wealth, health, happiness. Amen.